Okay, so we're just gonna get started here. Uh, you see the list, but that's gonna be doing Hill County in Upper Road, and I, I kind of divvied this up off of just going off the map. And, uh, My name is Tristan Belgard, and I'm with Western Native Voice, and what we're doing here today is helping with Election Day. Mainly our work consists of getting people to the polls. I, as far as I'm concerned, I don't care how people vote. For Native people, I would just say since, you know, 100 years ago we didn't have that right to vote, I would say that that's very important because, you know, our ancestors, we don't want them to have died in vain. You know, we want them to realize that what they fought for, we're gonna, we're gonna utilize that because at one time we never had those rights. So I would say just from a Native standpoint, recognizing that and saying it's bigger than me. Being able to just have somebody come pick up your ballot so you don't have to risk driving on these harsh roads in the winter time, it's, it's a good thing. A lot of elders don't have access to vehicles or we need to provide handicap accessible vehicles. We do provide transportation to the polls and to pick up ballots or even to get registered and vote at the same time. Hi, Twyla. My name is Ronnie Joe, and I'm with Western Native Voice. I'm just calling to see if you had the chance to vote yet. I would say we are fairly new to this process. Native Americans have not always had that right to vote. And we became citizens in 1924. And for me, my grandpa was 14, and so my mom would be the first one to fully participate in this process, and I would be the second. And um, I feel people think it's, you know, a long time ago, but for me, it really wasn't. What our team is starting to do now is to door knock, just to let them know, hey, it's an election, um, seeing if they're registered to vote. Right now we're in Bighorn County, so they have to go to Hardin if they want to register to vote. Where we were at in Lame Deer, they have to go to Forsyth to register to vote. Each trip is about an hour to two hours. Um, so that's, a, that's also a challenge. <laughs> You know, not everyone knows how it is to live on the reservation. You know, towns are like 15 miles apart. We have really bad weather. The roads are affected by that. We have limited hours in our post offices, specifically where I lived. They were open two days out of the week, and it was like from 8 to 11, so you would have to make that window just to check your mail. I would say there's limited communication. We don't get service in all areas of our reservation, including Wi-Fi. So there are a number of challenges that are unique to voting in Indian country that exist here in Montana. And I think it's fair to say that the legislature knew about all of these barriers when they enacted the legislation back in 2021. One of the challenges on some reservations is that there is a lack of residential home delivery, so it's much more difficult to cast an absentee ballot by mail. So organizations like Western Native Voice, some tribal governments will travel out into a community utilizing community members, paid ballot collectors, to go pick up an individual's ballot and return it to the ballot box. Thousands of ballots have been cast historically relying upon paid ballot collectors. So the legislature enacted a new bill that would have made it impossible for organizations like Western Native Voice to pay their organizers to collect ballots. The second uh, targeted attack was on the elimination of what we call election day registration. Voter attention is most acute on Election Day, and many people were relying upon Election Day to actually cast their absentee ballot and register to vote as well. So that new law made it impossible for people to late register and cast an absentee ballot on Election Day, which again was one tool that was disproportionately relied upon by indigenous voters in Montana. We, in collaboration with our allies and partners, filed constitutional challenges against the bills, basically arguing that they violate our constitutional right to vote, that they violate our constitutional right to freedom of association, 
uh, that they violate our constitutional right to equal protection of the laws and that they violate our constitutional right to due process. These lawsuits are just part of the ongoing narrative of policymakers not proactively doing the right thing for all Montanans, but especially Indigenous Montanans. And so um, it, is, it is our obligation as, as, a, as a group of individuals to hold them accountable in these ways. And so we showed up to Helena to provide testimony as to why these policies shouldn't go into place, explaining that there are ongoing situations and conditions that make restriction of access to voter registration and to the ballot a dangerous precedent and a dangerous condition to continue to nurture. And when those voices fall on deaf ears, then we have to take them to court for accountability. The Secretary of State, who was the defendant in the case, vigorously defended those bills. And essentially what Secretary Jacobson argued was, look, um, paid ballot collection could result in voter fraud, that somebody might you know, pick up somebody's ballot, change the ballot, and return it. Um, and that on election day, uh, keeping, allowing for late registration on election day poses a burden on some elections administrators. So setting aside a couple of things. One, there is zero evidence of voter fraud in the context of ballot collection in Montana. Zero, none. And two, even a, a minor burden on an elections administrator cannot be a good reason to deny an individual's right to vote. You know, we were able to cross-examine them and demonstrate that, in fact, it's not really a burden to on an election administrator to permit election day registration. And that, in fact, there is no evidence of voter fraud in the context of paid ballot collection. And in fact, when I cross-examined the Secretary of State's attorney, he testified that in order to find any evidence of voter fraud in Montana, he had to go to the Montana Historical Society and come up with some examples from 150 years ago. And it culminated in a two-week trial this last August in which, in a nearly 200-page order, a district court judge said, indeed, those two laws were unconstitutional and were therefore struck down. I think if past is a predictor of the future, that we are only going to see more and more robust attacks on the voting rights of any number of vulnerable sections of the voting public, from indigenous people to disabled people to young voters, and that we, again, are just seeing sort of a wholesale effort to disenfranchise vast sections of the voting public. Well, you know, in 1983 is when we began to realize that we had some real structural troubles here. Virtually everyone we talked to had had some really amazing, what you'd call abject experiences of discrimination, but they never called it that. They called it, that's just the way it is. That's what they'd say. Well, that's just the way it is here in Hardin. We found out things that we never dreamt of. For example, we found out that there were 11 cases of deaths where there, it was definitely murder. In the community, the death was known as murder. But the coroner had ruled on 11 or 12 deaths in a period of five years accidental. That's just one example. We found a teacher, 35 years of this one teacher, never awarded a child who was Indian over a C. 35 years of teaching. The more you found evidence, the more you realized every year brings such injury to your people. People are injured by this discrimination every single day. 
in 1983, we decided to sue the county and school district of Hardin for violation of voters' rights under the Voting Rights Act. At that early stage, in 1983, we were just at the beginning of understanding just how inequitable our county and our school district were in terms of delivering services that should have been delivered to all citizens, all children, and so on. We would register voters, and I, I and others would take a batch of maybe 25 or maybe 50 voter registration cards into the county clerk but when we asked for the list of voter registrations, the printout would come, of course, by precinct, and then we would keep a list of whose card we had taken in and find out that they weren't on the list. The clerk would say, well, you know, that's a third Eddie Littleite that you've registered, and we just don't think there's that many Eddie Littleites. The other thing that she wouldn't do is allow more people in a box, a post office box. So, I mean, you know, the conditions that indigenous people live under, getting their mail, and how we name our children, and how we are in our families, those were problems, because she'd just, she'd just throw them away. Nothing changed because we filed the case. In fact, things intensified. In the year 1984, I went in to visit with the clerk, and I said I'd like to get 500 cards, we have a goal of registering 500 new voters. And she said, I'm only going to give you 10 cards. You get all these cards, and you probably throw them in the trash on the way out. And I said, no, we're registering voters, and I have workers that are going to be uh, going out to the districts, the various precincts. And, and she said, no, she said, I want you to sign right here. And she made me sign for numbered registration cards. So we sent several workers in to get 10 more cards in a batch, 10 more cards, and we had to sign for them. But one of our workers was the wife of one of our plaintiffs. Her name was Chloe Small. She is non-Indian, blonde hair, blue eyes. She went in and she, she was just all nice. And she said to Mrs. Lippert, I'm registering voters out in my district. Can I have some cards? No questions asked. She handed her 50 unnumbered cards. Now, this lawsuit had already begun. That's the intent to discriminate right there. And if you read the case, you will see that the judge writes that up as the intent to discriminate, which we didn't have to prove, but we did. But just because one litigation is one doesn't mean it corrects anything in the rest of Indian country. And it's really important to remember that most of the work in Voting rights is on the ground. It doesn't go out there and correct all these egregious situations of abject discrimination. Nothing marvelous happens from it. No one comes in from the Secretary of State's office and tells the clerk, clean up this mess. No one comes in and says, Mr. Coroner, you're going to jail for this. Oh, that coroner was still in office 20 years later. It's entirely on every single one of us who care about voting rights and the rights of American Indians under the Constitution. We have to be vigilant. We can't figure that just because we corrected this in 1983 that it's just going to be great from now into eternity. It isn't. You know, I don't have a crystal ball as I sit here today as to, you know, where the next fork in the road is going to, to be. Uh, but fair to say that I expect that the state will appeal the district court's order uh, to the next level, which is the Montana Supreme Court. And that's dangerous for a couple of reasons. You know, one, there's always the possibility that the Montana Supreme Court could side with Secretary Jacobson. But two, the arguments that they'll be making are that our bedrock constitutional rights don't mean anything. That the right to vote might mean something for somebody and something entirely different for somebody else. And that is very troubling when we think about, you know, the foundation that we have of our constitutional rights. And as soon as we start eroding, you know, for example, the right to vote, what does that mean for the other fundamental rights contained in the Constitution?
So we, we will, as we have from the outset, be fighting like cats and dogs to make sure that constitutional rights are, are vindicated and protect the voting rights of all Montanans, but most particularly indigenous voters in our state.